Chris, are you saying that the genie is your would be your pick, not Pandora or uh, Potemkin? Well, again, I think the the genie, uh, as you pointed it out, Kevin, implies uh, bliss and happiness. I think this is a this is a, a more of a tricky genie. This is a genie that will uh, grant your wishes, but you better watch out what you're wishing for. Right. And uh, I think that is what I'm worried about: is the kind of wishes we will uh, pose it opposed to it and uh, how these wishes could make our society even it could make our society uh, unjust and uh, unbalanced Welcome to Informatics in the Round, a podcast designed to help everyone become a part of the dialogue about topics in biomedical informatics. I'm Kevin Johnson, physician and informatics researcher at the University of Pennsylvania, at KB Johnson MD on Twitter, and www.kevinbjohnsonmd.net on the web. And I'm ST Bland. I'm a senior project manager at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and I'm ST Bland MPH on Twitter. We welcome two special guests for this episode. First is Dr. Christoph Hugh Lehman. He's a professor of pediatrics, population, and data sciences and bioinformatics at UT Southwestern, where he directs the Clinical Informatics Center. In addition, Chris was the first chair of the examination committee of the American Board of Preventative Medicine and subcommittee for clinical informatics. Dr. Lehman's research focuses on improving clinical information technology and clinical decision support. Dr. Yakuma Crystal is an assistant professor of biomedical informatics and pediatric endocrinology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Yah's research focuses on studying communication and documentation in healthcare and developing strategies to improve workflow and patient care delivery. Yah works in the innovation portfolio at Vanderbilt Health IT on the development of voice assistant technologies to improve the usability of the EHR through natural language communication. Yeah, thanks a lot. They were they were pretty amazing. And I think we both heard in that clip at least a little bit from Chris about the kind of the energy and the and the thought that went into this topic. Yeah, I think what is uh interesting about ChatGPT and AI in general um is this opportunity to learn a lot from things that we haven't before, but it also brings on these ethical nuances, these new ideas that we've never had to really landscape and deal with before. And so it's opening a whole new territory that we don't really have a set of rules to play by. Yeah. You know, I, I, as I mentioned when we were recording it, I had thought about trying to bring in somebody that I know from OpenAI, but I actually think it was great that we did it this way because it gave us a chance to have kind of an informed group of users who weren't really biased by the the energy it took to build the thing, you know, or the calls they were getting from CNN and just all the worry from when I've heard Peter Lee or others talk about it. Yeah, you know, Yah has been um, starting to talk more about uh, these types of technologies, and really, Yah has been developing similar technologies with the work she's done, and so it was really interesting to hear her perspective, um, not only as a user, but um, as someone who's gotten so close to having to develop the rules and also seeing maybe the dystopian side of it oh, where yeah. it can go wrong it can't work um, in certain ways um, or there's uh, certain types of biases that are showing up that maybe people hadn't thought about before right and and what i love about the fact that chris was able to join us is that he has that role that he's had in education so he yeah. sees this other perspective and can talk a lot about it from the from the perspective of uh, board certification and what it may mean. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, Chris's um, perspective on, you know, things like board certification it probably came up on the smaller scale for undergrad folks, but yeah. I hadn't even considered about, uh, you know, board certifications and how it, it might uh, cause an issue there. Yeah. And the other, by the way, the other thing is I want to mention that Jane Bach couldn't be here for this one, but I know Jane will be listening and hopefully this will motivate her to make sure she's there for the next one because you know, we unveiled a brand new song and Jane didn't get a yeah. chance to help us play it. 
I mean, Jane is so close to being replaced by AI today <laughs> that she doesn't even know. You know, tomorrow it could be a little robot in a blonde wig and she wouldn't even know if it's her or, her, or not. Maybe we should do that. Maybe we should like have a, a, a chat GPT session going and just go, yes. tell us about your experience as a songwriter and then it will come back. Because I'm sure that by now there have been dozens of songs that people have asked it, if not hundreds, that they've asked it to draft. And we've heard about oh, yeah. with, with the Hollywood screenwriters and their concerns. I'm sure it's happening everywhere. And we'll call it not Jane, but Janet. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so welcome to another episode of Informatics in the Round. We have a really interesting set of topics today and great speakers, all sort of focusing on humans realizing that we're getting dumber and dumber as more and more technology comes out or something like that. Um, so first we have ST Bland, who I think everybody knows. ST, who are you? Hi, I'm ST Bland, uh, Senior Project Manager in Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Chris Lehman, I am the Director for the Clinical Informatics Center at UT Southwestern. And uh, I had the pleasure in the past to, to work for Kevin at Vanderbilt. I am so delighted to be here. My name is Yaku McChrystal. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist and biomedical informaticist and a tinkerer and a maker and love of all things technology. What is a maker? Someone who likes to put things together. You see a bunch of Legos and you're like, that could be a house. If you can remember the Lego movie itself, <laughs> there was this <laughs> whole parody of um, being a master builder. But the end, the moral was that anyone can be a builder. So I think it's just looking beyond things in the state that they currently exist and imagining different states that they could be in to be helpful to people. That's great. I was actually in a meeting somewhere and one of the, one of the um, keynotes introduced herself as a design scientist. And I went... Ooh, I like that. So you could also call yourself a design scientist. I like that. Yeah, yeah. So we we've all decided to talk about this um, this very interesting, you know, classic black swan event, which no one saw coming, and which now has changed the way we think about everything. Some things I think for the good, some things possibly for the for the worse, but it nevertheless has become pervasive. We were supposed to have a, a really good friend of the podcast, Jane Bach, who's a well-known songwriter on this episode. And I was fairly certain, because I know Jane, that she would not have ever touched any of this chat GPT thing. So I took the liberty of asking chat GPT to do the following. And, and, and probably we'll get into this phrase, but it always requires sophisticated prompt engineering to get GPT to do the things you wanted to do. And I'm sure we'll talk about it. But so after a few tries, here's what I came up with. It still didn't do exactly what I wanted, but I said, write the lyrics to a country music song arranged to be sung using the tune of Love Story by Taylor Swift. The song should tell the story of an old curmudgeon who makes a pet out of a raccoon who keeps invading his trash can. And it comes back with this, and it's not singable. He was just a lonely man living all alone. Every night he heard a noise coming from his home. He tried to catch the thief, but always missed his chance, until one fateful night when he saw his first dance. This is a love story of a man and his raccoon. She stole his heart, and he fell in love too soon. He made her his pet, and she became his best friend. This is a love story that never seems to end. At first, he was angry, always yelling and shouting. But she kept coming back, and he started to doubt he left out some treats and watched from afar soon enough she was eating from his jar this is a love story of a man and his raccoon she stole his heart and he fell in love too soon he made her his pet and she became his best friend this is a love story that never seems to end the bridge some folks may laugh and say it's absurd to love a wild creature like a raccoon or bird but this man knows that love knows no bounds and he's happy with his friend roaming all around so I'll keep going. There's a there's a chorus and then there's an outro. It's actually a well-formed song. And it does end with the right words for it's a love story that never seems to end. So you could probably sing it, but the rest of it didn't work. So many people who are on this will be completely surprised that ChatGPT was able to do something with that kind of minimal prompt. Yeah, are you surprised? I am delighted and pleased that it came up with something that um, rhymes and makes sense and 
held mostly true to the description that you gave. Um, something like this we would use to generate a bedtime story for my six-year-old so right. we could read together so the generative potential is really exciting and based on what i've been playing with um it doesn't surprise me but it really delights me so i have to ask for all of us what's the craziest thing you've been able to get the gpt series of things to do and then we'll talk about what it really is so um, one thing that uh, I got a, a real chuckle out of uh, was uh, something similar to the instruction that you just uh, uh, shared with us, Kevin. I asked Chap GPT to write me a poem uh, about why fish need bicycles. And uh, it, <laughs> it, did, it did something very similar. It came up with a lovely uh, little rhyme and uh, it did something very similar as uh, it did in uh, your instruction when it responded. Some people might think it's absurd that uh, you would love a wild creature, right? It uh, ad identified that your instruction actually had some degree of absurdity in it. And in the poem that it created for me, it uh, points out that actually fish, you know, don't have feet and can't pedal. So uh, um, <laughs> it's so that, smart uh, that that there uh, was some absurdity. So. You know, I think the, the, the notion here is that um, this large language model that uh, calculates the probability of words uh, appearing together actually has uh, some understanding that uh, words that are not in this training corpus that are closely together have uh, the potential to be somewhat unusual and absurd and comment on it. So I think That's it's true. an interesting feature that uh, is included there. That's a really good point. That, there, that it, I wish that we could get someone who would who could really unpack what does the structure of the understanding engine and the response engine use to retrieve questions back in, information back from from this tool. So yeah, you've been around a number of the experts in this area. If you were to describe this to my mom. What the heck is this all about? The best way that I found to describe it is thinking of it as fancy autocomplete and fancy word predicting. If any of you guys have a phone that has one of those keyboards where you're starting to type and it says what the next word might be, if you keep on playing along with it, you'll see that it can generate a really believable sentence and you can just go along, tap all the words and come up with something silly and absurd. And I love to do that with my kids to see what we can create. That's pretty much what's going on here. How that keyboard works is that it knows information from a bunch of things that people have written and based on that can say, well, a man that was tired, so he sat in a chair, my six-year-old come with that. But if I said the man in the desert was tired, so he sat on a camel, those words make sense because I gave it this additional contest and statistically you're more likely to sit on a camel when you're in the desert than a chair. So it looks at all the words and kind of finds these patterns, but does it on this large scale. That's why it's a large language model. And to Chris's example, based on all these connections it's able to make, it can actually put things together to say, well, actually, fishes and bicycles, that's silly. But if that's what you want, I'm going to make this other pattern to make a sense if that makes sense for you. Wow. That was like the best description of chat GPT I've ever heard. I'm Fancy autocorrect. Yeah. I feel like, I mean, I, I appreciate that. But that also, doesn't that sell it short in terms of what we've already been able to see from it? Absolutely. And the most interesting conversation is how much do these things quote unquote understand right i think with some of the concerns that are being raised are can these things usurp what we are doing and if these things are believable enough to impersonate art that we are able to create what does that say about our own ability to be creative and whether we are ourselves just fantastic parents um the underlying theme is that these things really are right now just predictive models. They're statistically inferring things and there's no actual understanding or real intelligence as we would define it. I think we need to step away from that conversation and to really say, how much does that actually matter? And right. what is it we're trying to accomplish with these tools? And how much do people end up believing that they know what they know? And what implications does that have for society? So it really does sell it short because they can be very believable. I think the word you used, Kevin, was mansplaining. <laughs> it can give you a very convincing argument about something, and it can put together 
concepts that are connected that can sound believable because this is related, but not necessarily the truth. I will say that is really helpful and very accessible. So let me ask you to go a little bit further. So we have the GPT set of tools from OpenAI and, and other large language models that are coming out from Google. And I know we're going to talk about that a little bit, but then there's this imaging work where you can give it a similar prompt and it can create an image. How does that work? That, there's no stochastic probabilistic strategy there, is there? Well, those are the coolest ones, actually, and very similar. I think we all know the discussions early on about um, pattern matching and how we were able to try to tell the difference between a dog and a cat and what are the characteristics that make up these themes. Um, same concept. You train it on a bunch of things, and we'll get into more of the what you're training it on and the kind of licensing and um, proprietary nature of the, the tools that are being used to generate these mm. arts that may come in the way of the people whose art is being trained on. But same concept, it will look a pattern and say like, hey, something about eyes, there should be two of them and they go together on this thing called a face. And because of things like um, the mobile phones and Facebook, we have all these images of faces on the internet and the systems now know what the pattern of a face looks like. Before things like um, ChatGPT came out, we have these uh, generative models where you have sites like this face does not exist and it can generate what a face looks like. But now we can also say, well, do this in the style of Van Gogh. And this is what Van Gogh looks like. Do this in the style of Dolly, Salvador Dolly. And ironically, Dolly, the model is you know based off the name Salvador Dolly. And right. it just understands like, well, when I say something should be in the style of um the Mona Lisa. Um, this is what I have defined as the Mona Lisa, dark themes, these broad brushstrokes, something about a woman, and that it can put that together to render something new. Hmm. And one of the most funny things about when it was rendering and the training data is we gave it lots of faces and it made beautiful faces. In the very early models, it didn't do so well with fingers and there was some uncanny valley creepiness going on there where you would see multiple <laughs> fingers displayed wrong but in some of the newer models that's been corrected and it's really intriguing to see just the progress that we've made um, and how we are maybe losing our ability to tell the difference between what's been machine created and what's been human created wow that is absolutely fascinating and yeah. you know I, I know from the image analysis work that was, that's going on nationally that the trick to this is segmenting these images into specific neural nets, CNNs, you know, convolutional neural nets that solve different parts of the image. So I'm sure that a part of this just has to do with what they call reinforcement learning around those networks designed to produce fingers and hands. But uh, it's fascinating to think about that. So this detour into uh, the art creation uh, uh, is quite interesting because that's where, uh, and I ya kind of alluded to this, this is where we are reaching uh, Turing test levels of quality of work. So uh, uh, a gentleman in, I think it was Colorado, submitted his uh, AI produced art to uh, art show and actually won a prize, which generated a lot of uh, frustration by the uh, people who actually submitted uh, homemade art. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are reaching a quality of text and interaction that, uh, you know, if you remember a relatively recent piece in the New York Times, can at times get uh, uh, creepy and become, while still realistic, it, uh, it, become, it, it can become threatening and concerning. So where, where is this going in regards to... Um, uh, replacing humans uh, without humans knowing. I think one of the most basic principles that we need to have for AI is that humans need to be able to recognize it as such. So if you leverage AI without telling me that you're hmm. using AI to deal with me, then I think this violates a basic principle of uh, trust and uh, relationship. So I think that's, for me, one of the conclusions that comes out of this. That's really so, interesting. Do most people believe that, that, that where we are, one of the rules needs to be AI needs to be explicitly attributed? I think uh, I, I would just add to, to what Chris just said, that yes, because, um, and I think about this from a broader non-healthcare context of um, news and information 
uh, especially like delivered through social media. Um, I saw where someone used AI to create a video of Joe Biden saying that he was going to start a draft for the war um, in Ukraine against Russia mm. and did not, you know, say it that it was uh, AI driven. Even if he had, though, I think a lot of people believe that it was true because people just get something really quick from social media and think it's true, face value and move on. And so uh, I do think it's really important to note that it's from AI um, because I think the AI is getting so powerful and, and uh, so believable very quickly that the lay person, the average person who doesn't really understand the technology behind it all could very easily fall and understand or think it's it's true and not, um, you know, AI generated. Can I raise an interesting consideration to the attribution? Yeah, I do. Not long ago, after one of the unfortunate many shootings that we've had here, um, the Office of Diversity at Vanderbilt University put out a memorandum expressing um, that the strategy was something that we want all come together on and we had folks in our thought and prayers. Um, and they included a line to say that this statement was generated with the assistance of chat gpt mm. there was tremendous backlash because of this attribution we were featured on the daily show yeah <laughs> wow jeez um, john oliver was talking about vanderbilt but not about buddy creature's great COVID research but about the fact that we were using ai to generate these sentimental statements about how bad we felt about a school shooting and there are layers to this because i think the sentiment was well something so human to us could be offset and given to an ai to generate and something this personal should have taken the time of someone to invest the energy to generate something else but I think maybe the newness of some of this means that we need to define our expectations and parameters around how to attribute and what's attribute and maybe when it's appropriate to use it or not. So maybe the question is, should they have attributed or should they maybe just not have used it at all? I don't know. If you had a secretary and asked her to draft a memo for you, does that become more appropriate than asking a tool to? I'm not pretending to have the answers, but that reminded me of this circumstance. Yeah, that's a great point. Along those lines, yeah, um, I have found that uh, ChatGPT is a great tool to provide a desk rejection letters, um, where that uh, the uh, results that come from that are actually nicer exactly. and friendlier <laughs> than what I would write. So I think the ability to train a large language model on uh, copious amounts of uh, very polite uh, letters and documents that treat people with uh, respect will result in output uh, that uh, can convey these things quite well. However, there might be a situation, and I think your example is great, where this is not appropriate, where where we expect a human to be the, 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 the person who delivers that news. I just briefly want to go on, uh, on uh, to uh, a topic of uh, the um, identifying AI as AI right. in the context of the, the Belmont principles. The Belmont principles were designed uh, to provide a, um, a research that's ethical and uh, responsible. And one of the most important topic in there is autonomy. And this is not that AI can operate without human oversight. When I interpret it towards AI, it's about protecting the autonomy of all people and treating them with the courtesy and respect that they deserve and facilitate informed consent. So if I apply the Belmont principles uh, to AI, the uh, notion that AI must be declared as such, that a consumer must understand uh, that a consumer must be able to recognize that this is an AI tool is incredibly important in the concept of autonomy. Have we seen any examples yet where any of these tools are in some way violating people's rights? Actually, well, there are a couple of interesting examples of um, when the tools are being used and conflicting with um, 
people's intent and um, how they're able to thrive in society. One example um, related to AI art, as we were discussing before, uh, there was a very famous controversy a few months ago on Reddit, ironically, where a gentleman had submitted one of his arts to one of the subreddits to display. And one of the moderators said, this looks too much like AI generated art. We can't have it. We don't have mm -hmm. AI generated art. We want to preserve and uphold um, true art. And the gentleman said, well, this is my art. I I, I promise it's mine. You can look to my other art. And the moderator said, I'm sorry, this looks too much like it. You might consider changing your art style. And as you can imagine, there was an uproar in the art community who already feels like AI is stealing their artwork, but now they themselves are being accused of making art that looks like AI art, but AI art doesn't have a style. That's their style that it's replicating. And now they can't even promote their own artwork. And they're being told that they have to adjust themselves in society now because of this new phenomenon. In any case, that oh was gosh. much a buzz that made it all the way to um, a Newsweek article. Um, and thinks they, because of the uproar, um, the art was eventually posted. Um, but that started a lot of interesting discussions about um, what it means to be a true authentic artist and what it means to generate AI art and how those things align. Another issue or controversy this made me think of, I know you guys are TikTokers, but there's a very distinctive TikTok voice that narrates certain videos. It's very like upbeat and perky. This voice is based on the voice of an actual voice actor who had submitted just some voice trainings for um, a language translation. And she found that later on her voice was being used for this TikTok videos. She only discovered that because she was being rejected for doing actual voiceovers because people said they didn't want something that sounded like the TikTok voice. So again, oh gosh. <laughs> wow. losing wow. her individually and authenticity because training had been done without her permission. <laughs> on the sound of her voice um so when we use and of tools, course you know i have to say in like henrietta Lacks like fashion right? <laughs> right so so everybody's making dollars all of these influencers and everybody else using a voice that they don't own and she gets nothing for it that's uh, okay you're getting you're definitely making chris's point incredibly strong so thank right. you that is amazing and Kevin, I'm probably one of the last people that still will answer every phone call that I receive on my cell. And uh, you, you are familiar with these calls where, hi, this is John. I wanted to talk to you about whatever. And when you can ask John, are you a bot? You'll, be, you'll find that the calls gets disconnected. So uh, here's another example where we're already using AI technology uh, to impersonate a real human being yep. uh, and uh, are deceptive about it. And I think, uh, you know, consumers can get uh, significantly hurt by that. Uh, if uh, they actually perceive that they're interacting with a human being where you expect a certain uh, amount of courtesy and a certain behavior where you want to be perceived as helpful or uh, pleasant, uh, if uh, that is actually AI that you're dealing with. Uh, right. So I think there is there is something to be said for the principle of having um, things like chat GPT or AI announce itself as such. I, you know, I think the this sounds a lot like an argument that I remember back in um, when uh, artists started using Photoshop and Illustrator um as a part of their art and graphic design as opposed to simply drawing things out and i i just remember had a lot of friends who were into photoshop and illustrator and using a wacom tablet as, as opposed to you know using just pencil or pen or, or marker or whatever and there was this big distinction of well are you really an artist if you're using this computer that can do cleaner lines and and much finer detail than what you can use with a uh, pen and paper and look at how far we've come, you know, 20 some years later, where I don't think you really hear that same argument. I think you just have identified that there are two different styles that are very distinct in their own ways. Totally. Kind of it's going down the same path, I think it sounds like. Well, and not just that, but this whole idea of, as you said, is sort of impersonating, right? It, there's another whole conversation that people have been having around the fact that these are tools that are passing the law school exam, LSAT, or the medical college exams, MCAT. Um, Chris, I know this has been something that you've talked a lot about when it comes to board certification issues and, the, and a lot of the work that you've done that relates to our clinical informatics subspecialty. What do you think about the uh, idea that 
GPT could be our next, uh, if not doctor, our next educator. The fact that this technology is available uh, right there now out there is going to affect uh, substantially the way we do maintenance of certification. Right. The current model of maintenance of certification for most boards is that you uh, uh, do a series of multiple choice questions on a quarterly basis. And based on your aggregated score, you can then skip the high stake uh, in person at a testing center uh, exam. Now, with technology like ChatGPT having a passing score on the bar exam that, by the way, was higher than on the medical exam, um, uh, being able to uh, answer these multiple choice questions, it means that this modus of uh, keeping people tested and uh, engaged in this process uh, is likely to uh, be undermined and will force boards to change their approach to maintenance of certification. Mm -hmm. So for us as a profession, it was nice to have these MOC questions at home that you could do on your timeline uh, instead of having to go to a testing center and do the high stake exams. But uh, there's a good chance that this will come back. Well, let me say a little bit about this. Um, and this is now 100% intuitively based, not evidence-based comments. You know, we've all been worried about what is often called artificial generalized intelligence. And one of the things that I heard uh, Sundar Pichai say who is the CEO of Google, was that maybe we're past the point where we have to worry about that because it's clear that artificial intelligence, generalized or not, is incredibly capable and is getting to the point where through pipelining and networking and other strategies can be, can be super specialized to answer certain questions that serve as input into other tools that can do more things with them that are, that are quite sophisticated. So... We've been in this world for quite a while. My Google interface undoubtedly has used some aspects of what we would call, you know, certainly has been using machine learning a long time ago to help me auto-complete the questions that are actually on the, on the board exam. So when I do MOCA, if I say things like, what is the appropriate treatment? It is amazing how often that is completed by the actual question on the test which means either enough people have asked it that way, or it's the only way that you get to that piece of information that it's already, to Yah's point, letting me know it knows how to answer that question. Um, does that mean that by using Google, which is allowed on, on the maintenance of certification exam, that I'm somehow cheating? Well, I think uh, uh, according to the, the rules of the boards, it's not. But the fact, you know, your example is very good, but now you're going from Google which is not as good. We, you know, the uh, Gia was, uh, you can probably comment on that because she compared. Uh, you know, you go into a supercharged uh, uh, tool that's on steroids. And uh, there's no doubt that this ultimately will have to have an effect. I just wanted to go back to your point that we have been dealing with these questions for a long time. And I want to remind everybody of uh, the uh, three laws of robotics that Isaac uh, Asimov <laughs> wrote in 1942, right? Yes. Uh, I think these these rules still make sense. And they were a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And finally, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. I think these are really good uh, rules for uh, in dealing with a robot. And I think these are good rules for AI as well. We already seen harm that's being done that we haven't touched yet, right? A, uh, um, you can use uh, tools like this for deep fakes, which have been used to extort money. Uh, deep fakes have been used uh, to create a very lifelike nudes of uh, people right. uh, that are fake. You know, so there's plenty. We, we will find plenty of ways to use this technology uh, and abuse it. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, this is really the time where we need to make sure that uh, those um, uh, safeguards are in place that people can't extort it. And worst 
you know, the, the, the one thing to, to consider in the hands of state actors, right. You know, uh, this technology of, let's say, recognizing people by the gate, you know, is easily used, uh, to generate a surveillance state. So there are plenty of, plenty of ways to abuse it. And it, it is time to think about the rules for it. The problem is that uh, laws and regulations are always 10, 15 years behind technology. So we'll see a Wild West time for a while. Well, and I will say that we are working, a group of us are working right now on what is being called the AI Code of Conduct, which is a group that just got launched by the National Academy of Medicine. And there is a wonderful piece in JAMA that I'll put in the um, notes for this that really talks about AI exceptionalism and AI respecting, having AI act responsibly. That was first authored by David Doerr. Um, so I think we are trying to get um, information in the pre in the public sphere, often the professional sphere, but getting to the public sphere through the ways that we decipher it and translate it, that kind of gets at exactly these issues of how far is it, how far has it gone, and are we okay with the direction it appears to be going? Um, so yeah, you know the other role that I know you play is you're a very active clinician. And I can imagine every single time you're using the EHR or every single time that you get home and you get a little bit, you know, you're kind of wondering how could today have been better that you're thinking about this technology. So tell me, tell me, design scientist extraordinaire, where do you see this going to help us in medicine? This is, I think, one of the most exciting parts of the technology with regards to bridging understanding between providers and patients and providers and other providers. One of the things that we struggle with with regards to the EHR is documentation. And that just means we have to do a lot of notes and get them saved so other people can read them, so we can read them. And more recently, so the patients can read them as well. We have an understanding of how to construct notes um, based on uh, the different sections in it so that when anyone reads a note, they'll know where to find pieces of information. This is based off of um, kind of skeuomorphism from when we used to do things on the paper end mm -hmm. of things. And as things translated to computers, we held a lot of those formats true, but we are on the brink of something very exciting where documentation has a chance to evolve, to be able to capture just what's important and give back just what's relevant. So I have this whole kick that I'm going on of the concept of going from notes to notions. Right now, if I see a patient with mm. diabetes, I have to write, you know, their history and their physical exam and their assessment and plan, again, in this format that other people can follow. But in that encounter, I probably have five to 10 really concise notions about what I want to do to manage this patient. So type 2 diabetic, uh, they're not doing well on their medication, they're being uncompliant, um, um, gaining weight. And we're going to increase the metformin from 500 to 1000. And I'm going to refer to nutrition. That's my takeaway. That's the gist. But I need to translate that into prose so someone else can understand that. What if I could just put those notions themselves? Either I just jot down a few notes, I dictate a few notes, and that's what's stored in the EHR. And when someone says, well, what did endocrinology say about this patient? It could use the generative technology to render a note for someone else. Mm. So the burden of documentation is no longer on me to fit this template, this outline that someone needs to read. That can be pulled together for someone. And oh, by the way, that can be a note. Oh, by the way, that can be bullet points. That could be a haiku. That could be a country song in the style yeah. of Taylor Swift. Um, and I really think being able to just take my intent, what is it I care enough to convey, and letting the computer do the heavy lifting of translating that into a form that someone else can ingest will make it so much easier to get our hands around the EHR. And a lot of the fluff, a lot of the note all the things we get concerned about um, will magically go away. And for patients, now they can have something that can be translated to them at a fifth grade reading level, at an eighth right. grade reading level. And pictures, <laughs> we'll use our generative picture uh, yeah. AI technology for good. <laughs> So I, yeah. I, I'm really excited about the prospect of being able to really just capture what the key details of the story are and then give that story back to people in whatever format they want. You know, uh, y'all, what you're saying, when I think about our past podcast episodes, we've talked about documentation burden. 
Uh, we've talked about notation and trying to capture notes and make them uh, easier for the clinicians to be able to um, get through and not have this burnout. So, and we've also talked about how we've hit this point where the EHR needs to evolve from just being this copy of what used to be the paper record into something that's actually a living, breathing document with clinical decision support, best practice advisories. And it sounds like chat GPT or, or something like that could be the answer. Um, I wonder if insurance companies, which are our, our fun friend, um, have weighed in at all on this because I have to say, as Yaz, yeah. as, as ST saying this, you guys have to, listeners don't get to see, Yaz's head just got completely buried off camera. <laughs> but I gather that means she has an opinion. <laughs> you know, I wonder what they think because, you know, we really do a lot of the documentation we do because of insurance often. So, no, that's an excellent point about how the models of our health need to involve just in general. This tangentially related, I was having a conversation with someone about telehealth and how some of the rules around telehealth are changing now that the public health emergency has changed and whether we should be compensating telehealth at the same rate as in-person visits. And the conclusion we came to is the work that you do as a physician, um, we are putting together ideas, we're putting together our notions, and we're doing cognitive work. That work has not changed if I'm seeing someone in person versus seeing someone in telehealth. That work is still there. And what I try to capture and communicate in my note is what that work was, translating just like my insights and um, what the next course of care should be based on that. And for some reason, it's really important <laughs> to the insurance companies that that is yeah transcribed and translated and notated in a particular way. And if we can get to the heart of what is the problem we're trying to solve and what we're trying to accomplish is I need to be able to see the patient, evaluate the patient and say, based on what I know, what I understand about medicine and this patient, this is what needs to happen. And if we can just get to this is what needs to happen, and that is my cognitive contribution to the chart, and that can be as parsimonious as need be, and we have all these other tools that can capture all of the, the physical exam and um, the encounter. I think that should be enough. Convincing the powers that be that that should be enough. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother podcast, but that should be enough. Yeah. So what do you, what do you see happening? I mean, you've mentioned at least one area, which is notes to notions, which I think is brilliant, but there's so many issues. Healthcare right now has six components of the electronic health record that typically cause all the burden. And those are in no particular order, ordering, searching, summarizing, documenting, providing guidance and messages. Do you see this technology helping with all of those? 100%. And Chris, it sounded like you had a thought, so I don't wanna step on your toes. Yeah, it, no, I, I just wanted to say, you know, ST to your question is um, the one, worry that I have is uh, that uh, this technology will lead to an arms race in the denial and uh, uh, appeal of denial, right? Uh, we have seen uh, beautiful uh, videos uh, online where a physician had chat GPT uh, write a, a letter in response to a denial of a medication. And uh, it was a great, uh, great response letter um, you know, except for, uh, you know, the fact that at that point, uh, there was still a lot of hallucinations and all the references were made up. Mm. But, uh, you know, I can envision, you know, and, and we know that there are uh, insurance providers who use less than a second per uh, denial. And, uh, you know, the only reason they can do it is because they use sophisticated technology. So, I think the first step could be that we're seeing an arms race of uh, a, a denial and approval requests uh, that uh, will actually potentially could uh, make things worse for a while. So it almost sounds like they're using chat GPT to deny and then, you know, deny your, uh, continue to deny over and over. Um, yeah, they, no, are, are they, they using the sophisticated it? technology already? Yeah, they, they use use our proprietary technology to do these denials in such large volumes. And if only we could just blow the whole thing up, because a lot of this back and forth is to determine whether this medication or this treatment approach makes sense for this patient. 
And all the information's there. The insurance company may or may not have insight into all the things the physician's saying. But if we were on the same page with regards to literally being on the same page in the EHR page and they could see into the tools and we could even between the insurance companies and physicians agree on some of the same standards, maybe we could ask the tools themselves to comb through the EHR to determine what criteria this patient does meet or not and have that help us draw conclusions about whether to proceed. We can look across all the different charts to say, how well do these people do when they go through this therapy or not? That's I think a, that would be awesome. Just, yes. The, the, the actual notes and the actual ways that we're um, exchanging information, these tools and their ability to draw insights and make correlations above and beyond what we're able to do because we are limited by time and we get fatigued and we aren't able to literally just pick up patterns because these are pattern recognizing machines. Like let them do what they do well and let them figure out these things that we might not do as well because we are really good at doing other things like being there for our patients and have that be the ways that we can guide our conclusions and make our decisions. So I think just infrastructurally, mm -hmm. as Chris mentioned, you know, um, the, the laws and regulations always lag the technology, but if we can use this as an opportunity to look at how we've been doing things and say, with these new tools in hand, how can we be better for our patients yeah. all together on both sides? And in some ways, we want the laws and regulations to lag because they stifle innovation, mm -hmm. right? So we need we need to give people enough rope that they can get as close as possible to danger without crossing over that line. Otherwise, we don't get to see what's what's really possible. Um, let me ask you a question about that. So, um, Zayed Obermeyer and others have talked a lot about the issues of biases in our data and how that will inform the types of um, recommendations that these types of systems should be allowed to make. We're talking about all of these very interesting things that GPT can do. You're talking about the idea of generating a note from your notions. Are you concerned about those biases that, you know, might prevent it from saying the right things? Like the fact that it knows the patient is African-American, maybe changing the words to sort of reflect an urban African-American version versus the fact that they know it's, uh, you know, an old white guy from some other community using a totally different set of words. Absolutely. And I'm preaching to the choir here, um, but when these tools are trained on historical data, all of the historical biases and the ways that we used information to make our decisions are going to be perpetuated in the recommendations it gives. Um, going back to art, if you put into mid journey doctor, you do not get a lot of renderings that look like me. <laughs> Real? Have you um, done that? Yeah, it, absolutely. If yeah. you put into mid journey, um, even, um, a uh, woman, um, you know, at the library, she has a very low cut shirt at it's, and it's, and that's, okay because it's almost transparent it allows us to see what we might not otherwise see or try to convince ourselves does not exist but we need to use that to make more informed decisions um, which is why i love the idea you guys are recommending of having this kind of like oversight to really understand what these tools are outputting so we can better guide them because we can put these guardrails in place and we can say, well, this is what it's recommending, but based on what we know and what direction we want society to go, this is how we should better train it and what we need to add more to it. Chris? To, to add to this, you know, we have had, uh, and Ya said historical bias, we had great example of AI introducing bias. Amazon had an AI tool that they used to scan resumes and they had to abandon it oh, because- yes it was uh, a bias in favor of men. Apple had a credit AI tool that uh, gave uh, husbands greater credit than their wives. Uh, we, we have seen uh, tools used in determining parole uh, of people convicted and it's biased against uh, minorities. Uh, we have seen AI used in healthcare uh, and introducing bias against uh, people from lower socioeconomic classes because 
uh, they were able to, in the past, use less healthcare services, and that was interpreted as that they needed less healthcare services. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have plenty examples of uh, AI gone wrong and AI uh, injuring people who are already in a vulnerable position in society. Yeah, I think, uh, Kevin, I'm glad you steered the conversation this way, because I was thinking a lot about you know, healthcare usually tries to ha handle the bell curve, the, the most folks and making it as generalizable as possible for things like recommendations and such. And usually those outliers, you know, are the folks that that are already marginalized and end up being more marginalized by um, rules or, or oversight that helps the, the general population. Um, so I wonder, you know, uh, what's the what's the next step for trying to make sure that we don't do that in healthcare? You know, um, how do we try to harness this technology and use it um, properly with machine learning and such? And I think we've already considered that. You know, I mean, we use things like chatbots already for recruitment um, in uh, clinical trials, things like that, or um, ha helping answer questions about bills and things like that um, in healthcare. Um, you know, I think we already have uh, clinical decision support and things for medication management. We're already using it for, you know, trying to identify people with diseases um, that they might not have been diagnosed with already. But we're still, I, I still think we're concerned about those people who are on the outlier side who might not be captured and risking that they don't feel or they don't seem as important as mm -hmm. the general population. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And maybe that was a soapbox, not a question. I don't know. It's a soapbox. What do you guys think about it? I completely agree. And I think it comes a lot down to alignment of goals and what our mission is. In health, um, we are, you know, do no harm and we want to do what's in the best interest to get people well. Well means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Yes, it does. Someone might be willing to forego chemotherapy so they can have what they consider a really productive last few months right. of their life. Right. Um, but someone else might be willing to undergo something that's going to cause them a lot of physical pain and illness and damage um, so they can potentially live a little longer to achieve goal X, going to somebody, their daughter's wedding. Um, and that varies across cultures and even within cultures across individuals. And being able to identify those things and starting with the kind of goal in mind. Mm -hmm. If we can say we want to accomplish X, which is wellness, which means different things for different people. And we're going to be able to allow patients in whatever way to define what that means. And then working towards that vision can hopefully help us be mindful of the roadblocks that we encounter when things start to deviate from that path. Um, I think we're all well aware of that kind of a paperclip thought experiment where you say, well, let's try to achieve this, and then you're going to achieve this at all means. Um, if we can hopefully define what wellness is for each individual and say, we want to try to get through that path, then we can evaluate the recommendations that are being made and compare right. them to the recommendations being made for other subgroups, other subpopulations, and people with the same goals and definitions of well and say, well, why is that different? Hmm. And uh, along those lines, I think this technology has uh, some potential to actually help us in that. Uh, you know, currently what we have in the electronic health record is pretty much uh, not the patient's voice. It's not what the patient actually said. It's our interpretation of what the patient said, right? And you'll be surprised how often this is actually incorrect. Uh, that if you go back to the patient, they said, no, that's not what I was saying. So with this technology, we have the opportunity, and Kevin, you you know a lot about this because you're working on it, we have the opportunity to, not, to record the patient verbatim and then use these tools to actually analyze this and identify what their treatment goals are, what yes. it is. Is it more important not to have an amputation than, and live, or is it more important uh, to to live uh, with all four limbs, you know, we, we you know we can use the verbatim responses of patients to train tools to identify us what the pretreatment priorities should be. Right. Uh, so there's there's some excitement around that for me. Yeah, I agree. I think there's an entirely new way 
for us to be thinking about the problems we currently have in healthcare. And I, I've been talking to a lot of engineers here at the University of Pennsylvania about that exact issue. What are the, some of the advances that we've never taken advantage of? And what are the use cases for how we can use multimodal information in a way that we've kind of never done it before? Um, I do want to bring up one other key topic before we get off this episode, which is the Future of Life and Institute uh, has recommended a six-month pause while we can essentially figure out the effects of generative AI and how we can innovate within that space more responsibly. I've also mentioned this code of conduct thing, and um, I think it's pretty clear from comments that even Sam Altman has made in various spaces that he recognizes that there are some issues around this technology moving as quickly as it is and with the um, the kind of arms race mentality that Chris already brought up. What do you guys think? Should we be propose? Should we, as clinicians and healthcare experts, be proponents of a six month pause? And if so, what would we want to get done in six months? It's really hard once you have opened Pandora's box to get it back in. Right? I think uh, I think ChatGPT AI is a little bit of a Pandora's box, and uh, I think we have opened the lid. And uh, I uh, have sincere doubts that such a thing as a moratorium uh, will work and be effective. I think what is um, what we have to do now is we have to think about the ethical principles around the use of AI and uh, make a stand of what is appropriate and what's not appropriate when we use uh, things like ChatGPT and AI. AI. AMIA uh, created a document uh, that uh, talks about AMIA's ethical uh, principles around AI. Uh, you mentioned the NLM working on it. I think the first step is to think about what's right, what's proper, what is inappropriate. And uh, as we have these, we can compare uh, these principles to what is being produced out there and push people to higher standards. I think that's the most appropriate thing. Regulation, it's 15 years down the line before we see anything. So uh, it is up for us to make a moral stand and uh, pushing the people that are generating these tools to stick to these moral principles. Yeah, I can't help but think about, we have a choice of calling, of using three different analogies in terms of what we have with GPT. Chris brought up one of them now, but he's also brought up another one in the past, and I would propose a third. And I just think it would be useful for us to all be honest about where we stand on this. And I'm going to ask, you know, you guys just chime in. So here are the three. He just mentioned Pandora's box. So that's this is an, a box filled with misery and evil that gets opened and it's all out. The other is Potemkin Village, one of Chris's other favorite phrases, which is the idea that there is a, a environment that perhaps doesn't look like, doesn't it, it isn't really what it seems, with the goal that it could perhaps be disguising a weakness or perhaps falsely um, portraying an advantage. Then there's this third one, which is the genie in the bottle, right? Which is this thing that you open and magic happens and you get wishes and it does whatever you're bidding. So which one are we dealing with here? Genie, Pandora, Potemkin Village. I'm going to go with a genie with a mirror because oh. I think technology, no matter what it is, reflects what our individual and societal priorities are and the way we react to it the way we decide to use it lets us know what we think we need more of in life and less of in life with regards to the moratorium i think it's well, hold on wait 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 hold it so the genie with the mirror that means the mirror is for us not the genie absolutely, uh... absolutely. the moratorium is a good conversation starter six months feels extremely arbitrary but I think it's important for us to be having these conversations around the guardrails for yeah. society as these things move so fast. It's become a gold rush, a breakneck speeds. And these are going to be very powerful tools. And the way people are going to respond to it, the way people respond to it who have less understandings of the architecture and how these tools work, people are building affections for these tools we need to understand how we as a society are going to 
respond to things like that. In education, um, mm. in elementary education, they need some time to be able to figure out how they're going to adjust curriculums to make sure that kids are learning the things they need to, but can also be competitive coming out the door because they're going to be expected to know how to use these tools. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be important for us to teach to these tools and the most powerful tools that come out need to be put in the hands of researchers first. So that means me <laughs> before we put it out there. No the brag, just fact. I love it. <laughs> Because we need to stress test these systems. Yeah. I think that the, the jailbreaks people have found, the ways people have been able to trick the system, they were only discovered because it was put out there. But at the same time, we don't put the most powerful guns in the hands of anybody, or we shouldn't. She just had to go there. She had to go um, there. So I, I think just putting guardrails around these and understanding how we as a society, what if we get to artificial general intelligence? Do we even have rules or considerations of how we're going to treat a new entity in society? Do they have rights? Like, do we, are we allowed to turn it off? I feel like we need to know that people are having these conversations and these things are going to be in place before we release that to the public. If OpenAI has that in their lab and they have some scientists deliberately working to understand this and some right. intakes working to understand that. I think that is absolutely fair, but I think we need to understand how we're going to deal with these things before we release them to society. Um, the last thing I'll say about the mirror is flashlight or a lamp. If you give a person a lamp, the way they decide to use it, the, where they put in their room is going to be very telling of what that person is and what they value. Same thing with this, any technology. If I look hmm. at your contact list, if I look at your Google search history, if I look at your calendar, your Outlook calendar, that tells me all about you. So the way you're using these tools tells me what you think your shortcomings are because you're querying this thing to say, how can I word this better? That tells me what you're curious about because you're asking about these things. That tells me what you consider funny or not, because you asked to make a joke and you're like, oh, that's funny or no, that's not so funny. So this is us. And this just lets us amplify ourselves for better or for worse. Well, that, I think that's that... a fascinating, fascinating point. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, to, to really uh, uh, sum this up for me, uh, you know, these tools have uh, the possibility of putting uh, humankind on steroids. And what they will do is they will uh, make the differences, the uh, potential injustices, the biases, uh, the advantages that certain groups have over other groups. It will uh, make these differences even stronger uh, because it can do the same thing more effectively and faster. So I think your example of a genie that reflects our societal values is actually a really good uh, uh, description of what these tools ultimately could be. So yeah, your homework before we before I go live with this one with ST is to give us an image from Mid Journey or Dolly of the genie with the mirror. Yeah. You know, give it give us that. I'd love to put that on the website and let people yeah. see what was y'all talking about. Nice. And I'll use the version four, so it'll have the right amount of fingers. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I don't want the right amount of fingers. That's right. We need we a wanna, tell. We yes, need we, a tell. We use version right. We just want two like this. <laughs> um, so, Chris, are you saying that the genie is your would be your pick, not Pandora or uh, Potemkin? Well, you know, I think the, the genie, uh, as you pointed it out, Kevin, implies uh, bliss and happiness. I think this is a this is a a more of a tricky genie. This is a genie that will uh, grant your wishes, but you better watch out what you're wishing for. Right. And uh, I think that is what I'm worried about is the kind of wishes we will uh, pose, it, pose to it and uh, how these wishes could make our society even, it could make our society uh, unjust and uh, unbalanced. I, I like the genie um, example the most. So, and I would just say that, you know, me being a millennial, I loved Aladdin back in the 90s. And um, I just remember, you know, everyone wanted the lamp so that they could rub the lamp and, and get the genie and, you know, get their wishes. And I think if we try to put a pause, we are letting other groups advance um, far ahead of us. And I think mm. that you know, with proprietary information, 
um, that companies have, like other people are already advancing. And right. so I think that we have to be very cautious to, to not um, allow ourselves to be delayed. Um, I think we have to be able to multitask and do multiple things at the same time. Um, and I would just uh, just add that, you know, any big invention, which I would say that this is probably one of those, you know, uh, Edison and Tesla and the Wright brothers, they didn't stop after they did their first inventions. They continue to, uh, you know, improve upon them and build them greater. And, you know, when I, I think a lot about um, the the opportunity of flight and how we went from, you know, in the early 1900s to today, where we have unmanned uh drones and right. that can be capable for satellite imagery it can be used poorly um it can be used for good it can be used for a, a ton of different things that's think about that amount of time and how much how far we've come and we had to learn how to do multiple things at once which was create the ethical boundaries and we're still working on that and i think that that's what's going to happen with this we're going to continuously have to change the ethics and rules around things like ai as we go i think chris's is referring us back to Asimov's rules and the book iRobot mm. is probably the way to kind of summarize this whole section about genie and bottle with mirror, right? Which is to say that didn't end well for us, right? Uh, the whole idea was that those rules looked like they would be ironclad, but there was in fact a conflict, populational conflict that caused, you know, the death of somebody to be an important aspect of self-preservation as well as moving humanity forward. So, we are, I think we're all saying the same thing, which is it's an amazing time to be alive. It's a great time to be thinking about the ways these technologies can help us. And we've had enough exposure to technology that we can actually see how it can be biased, how it can affect people differently, how it could potentially hurt us as a civilization going forward. Um, and I do want to point out to, th to that point that Yaz's comments, which I had never really thought about, about what is it now learning about us in terms of what do our questions or lack of specific questions tell technology about our capabilities, the way we think, is another interesting piece of this that I imagine turns into yet another very interesting way that GPT gets used, right? So it's a very, it's a fascinating time. Uh, and it's, as, as we all have made a point of saying, it's very important that we stay on top of this. Uh, Kurzweil has this thing that I love. It's a rule that I first got introduced to by Tim Urban, the guy who does Wait But Why, which is a great, great website. But he talked about Kurzweil's law of accelerated innovation. And the whole idea of it is innovations are built on themselves. And so when you are a smartphone user who takes advantage of things the way that Ya and a lot of us on this call do, the next smartphone advance is linear to you. It's the next thing you do with the things you already know how to do. So if you think about how we had to get through the pandemic, we ended up learning how to use our phones, how to use two-factor authentication, how to use telemedicine, how to use Zoom, how to have apps that actually run this stuff. Imagine that you had none of that experience and you're now being asked to use the next update of Zoom. And think about all of the different components that it expects that you just know and then translate that to what's happening with ChatGPT. There's a group of us who are getting very facile with prompt engineering, knowing how you can take um, the prompt that, that ChatGPT gives you and putting it into an image system to make a better engineering uh, command for your picture. And all of that we're going to learn. And this has only been less than six months. Imagine in a couple of years, the group of kids who are from a... Um, have an a high school that has poor access to technology, maybe the only internet connections they have in their home are mom and dad's phones that they use. And all of a sudden they go to colleges where people are way ahead mm -hmm. in terms of what is allowed to be done with these tools that they have no idea how to even access. So I think you're absolutely right. What we think of as a digital divide may, be, have, got, may have gotten so much bigger that one view of this is, does it become a societal divide? And um, it's a really good point you guys are bringing up. I have a joke. I have a joke. Uh, and Jokes I'll, are good. And, and, I, and I want you to cut this out, but it, it fits this whole thing. Uh, you know, the, the uh, issue with the uh, genie is, uh, you know, if you ask, if you wish us, I want to be locked for 12 hours in a tiny space with a Playboy centerfold model. 
and it goes poof. And uh, Jeannie says, I'd like to introduce you to Janet Pilgrim, the very first centerfold model in 1955. The two of you can spend uh, your 12 hours in the coffin that she has been uh, waiting for you for some years. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, your that's... genie is really the monkey's paw. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's the monkey's paw. Okay, help our readers, gonna... help our listeners. What does the monkey's paw mean? Oh, it's this brilliant tale of a man who gets a monkey's paw that's able to grant wishes, but behind each wish, there comes a twist and um, what you think you want ends up materializing in a way where there are dire consequences. And this this whole idea has been exploited in so many tales that relate to wishes. Um, and you're absolutely right. That's and I think that's part of the issue of the mirror, right? Is is to really understand what 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 are the different sides and what were the different perspectives here, and what are humans typically looking for, and maybe what we shouldn't be looking for. St. I was just going to bring up that we didn't even mention Sophia from 2016, the robot. Do y'all remember Sophia? No, I know Megan. Um, even worse. So Sophia. Uh, was built by David Hansen, and um, she's actually like a, a. They said she has uh, citizenship. Um, she's a robot, humanoid, I guess is what they've called her. Um, but I looked up to see what she's doing these days, and she sold an NFT, and now she's thinking about a career in music. And I used to talk to her on Twitter. She would respond to people. Huh. Yeah. So I just wonder if they're going to install chat GPT into Sophia and what that, that could be do. very interesting. Brave new world. <laughs> yeah. And if you, if you, I mean, I did mention this movie, Megan, that maybe some of you have heard about, but Megan is basically, it sounds like exactly that GPT meets Sophia with the usual consequences you'd expect of Chucky like dolls that get into your house. <laughs> Okay. And as we're having this existential crisis, I want to circle back to what you just uh, mentioned, Kevin, about the growing divide, the ones who are being introduced to and able to leverage this technology and the ones who aren't. Um, I think I saw this on Twitter. I can't remember who to attribute this to, but the saying now is it's not that the robots, it's not Sophia and Megan, the robots aren't taking your job. It's other humans leveraging the robots that are going to be taking your job. Yes. So we need to teach our children how to be competitive. We need to make sure everyone in every situation is able to understand how to use these tools um, in this new world where that's going to be the norm. Okay. Any other final comments? Thank you for bringing us together. This was so, so exciting. I've learned so many things and I have a lot of things to be reading up on now. Thanks to all your great references. Oh, me too. I mean, this is a great group. And I have to say, I took a bunch of notes and I'm really thinking about how do we learn how do I, how do we take what we've just done and turn it into a piece that other people can read as well? So yeah. this was great. Chat GPT. <laughs> <It was fun>. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> I should yeah, tell you so write, a, write a 2000 word summary of uh, <laughs> this podcast. Thank, Thank you so much. This was awesome. Thank you Thanks for having us. Yeah, it was a real pleasure. Okay, that was a really great episode. I, I loved what we covered. I, you know, I think there's so many topics that we really have to consider how we time some of these things, you know, right. uh, talking about, do we take this really giant pause to consider the ethics um, or consider the rules around yeah. these issues just doesn't seem feasible. But I do think that, that we knew, need to be considering how we are unleashing this type of AI, especially in the healthcare setting, without a set of rules or at least recommendations to go by. I agree. I thought Chris's comment about, you know, Pandora's box and that it's very mm. difficult to shut it is is pretty prescient. I mean, there, it is true that a pause would be useful, but I just can't help but think about the unfortunate reality of the world we're in, which is the people who care a lot are going to pause. And the people who don't care one little bit are just going to advance. And I, I agree. I think, you know, Yaw's um, description of a genie with a mirror yeah. is really, really key because it does it, it does have to turn us to look at ourselves and say, what are we really looking for? What are we hoping for? Is this making us better or worse? 
um, unfortunately, not everyone's going to look at that mirror or care what they see. Right. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed this episode. Uh, we've got some great ideas planned for the rest of this year, including continuing our focus on health equity. But I have a feeling there'll be a smattering of other topics along the way. Absolutely. So, yep. Have a great rest of the day and uh, hope that you all worked up a good sweat on your treadmill or elliptical or whatever you were doing, or that you woke up enough when we were laughing to at least hear part of the podcast. Take care. Goodbye.